One, two, three, four. Thank you for downloading Scuba Confidential. Welcome back to the podcast. We're back. Back again. Back again like a bad penny. It feels like only five minutes ago. It does feel only five minutes ago. This episode, guys, for those of you listening, is what I've, I'm going to call a bank episode. So we're recording this. Uh, well, I'm not quite sure when it's going to be released because we're, we're kind of keeping this one up our sleeve a little bit in case one of us has to go on holiday or is not around and we can't synchronise our diaries. <laughs> to record a podcast and we don't want to let you guys down so we're recording this and we're going to release it at a time when, when we actually need it so just... I, the reason I say that is we're going to get to some news items and if we, if we release this in six months time and the news items are out of date you'll have to kind of bear with us on this hopefully period. we can seamlessly slot it in somewhere <laughs> innuendo <laughs> alarm <laughs> innuendo alarm for that one out, and we only off. just started I oh, know so as you can hear folks um I've got my two friends with me here, Mr. Ian, Hello. Mr. Bungie, and Louise. Hello. Um, so normal services resume. There's also going We're to be back. a fourth voice on this particular episode that- of the podcast, who we'll introduce a little bit later on. A special guest. Oh, Ooh. excellent. I know, a special guest. Why is- can't you introduce me now? <laughs> <laughs> is it- do you know what? As soon as we invited you on, I thought you'd go jumping in it's like key. that. It's Hello, key. evening, evening. <laughs> <laughs> So you may have heard the dulcet tones of good friend of the podcast, Duncan, Duncan Baldwin, and we're going to get to meet Duncan a little bit later and about talk about what he does, and uh, he's got some tips for us on regulators and equipment servicing. So we'll, we'll get to that shortly. It's the off-season at the moment we're recording this, so we haven't really been in the water too, too much. I've been back in the classroom coaching some new students, and I know you've been working in the centre, Lou, and... Ian's been doing whatever Ian does day to day. Or we, we <laughs> I have been in the pool. I've been, have you? You've been yeah, I've been pool? in the pool. Excellent, okay. So, been... so it's not like we've, we've been isolated from diving, it just means we haven't been active out in, out in open water locally. Been on a down low, haven't we? I did been get some round of eights last week. So. Um, while we're recording this, and it may be, the horse may have bolted by this point, but um, coming up, there's a dive show in Coventry on the weekend of the 22nd to the 24th of February. It's called Go Diving Show. You can find it on the internet as godivingshow.com um, and myself, Ian, I think maybe Lou, we're not sure yet but we, you may see us wandering around yep. at, at the show Ian will be easy to identify with his podcast hoodie on Absolutely. alright, so if you do happen to see us don't be shy, just come up and say hello we, we'd like to sort of meet some people who, who've taken the time to download and listen yep. to us and any ideas and stuff it. like that you want to talk through <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you just come over, we, we, we're happy to you know we, We'd have to chat. shake your hand and have a little chat and um, and hear what you have to say. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, all good. Dunk's Dunk's waving something. Oh, he's well, waving. If, his... You know, if anyone wants anyone wants to buy a coffee or a mince pie or something while we're there, <laughs> feel free. Yeah. Biscuits. We're back to cake. Biscuit or a sausage roll. Biscuits. <laughs> yeah. We do like biscuits. <laughs> well, cake especially. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cake. Don't forget the cake. So yeah, that's what's happening. That's that's kind of what's coming up. Within this particular episode, to have the news very shortly, and then after that, we're going to have a little talk as the season is coming up. We got to thinking a little bit about equipment and what you may do pre-season to, to check your equipment and, and care for it. So we'll get to that in a little bit. But without further ado, I think it's time again, isn't it, for Louise with the news? Cool. First up on the news items, beaked whales get the bends. When, huh? when loud warships <laughs> interfere with their sonar. I wish people that? could have seen it in space at that <laughs> point. <laughs> right. Okay, so basically research has shown that sonar, so you know ships give off sonar, yep. yeah? It interferes with beat whales. Really? And it makes them so fearful that they basically... Yeah, but how do they get, get the suicidal. Well, you know, so... As divers, we get the bends if we ascend too quickly, yeah. and the nitrogen doesn't dissipate from our bloodstream. 
with these particular species of whales, they're basically driven to suicide because they they rise to the surface too quickly and the gas forms due to fear. So no they get so fearful because the obviously they're very sensitive mm. creatures mm. and the sonar interferes with with their natural kind of senses orientation <laughs> orientation yeah so when they're in the presence of sonar they're basically they're so distressed right. that they swim vigorously away from the, the sound source because they're trying to get away from their it. diving pattern yeah so and it basically means that they swim to the surface and they get, they get them so is this happening a lot or is, or is that a particular type of sonar? It's or? been going on co- coincidentally. So the research has basically shown that since sonar was introduced in the 1950s, there's been an increase in the number of beaked whales really? beaching themselves. And they've basically taken the research, looked at different factors, and sonar seems to be the, the and most And it's only one. those type of whales, that breed of whales? Just beaked whales, yeah. It? So it's in the Mediterranean. It's basically coincided with... Sona being used more frequently, yeah. Yeah. and yeah, the number of beached beaked whales. Yeah. yeah, it's a bit of a tongue twister, isn't it? But um, beached beak whales. I think that, I think that's interesting. It sort of ties in vaguely with a subject we talked about a few weeks ago, where a series of whales, I believe it was in New Zealand. I'm yeah. sort of trying to cast my mind back to that news item. Yeah, where they turned up beached. Yeah, and, that's and right. We sort yeah. of speculated at yeah. the time that I'd heard somewhere that marine traffic and sonar mm. and these kind of things and wind farms as well kind of interfere with. The natural navigation systems of mm. whales, but this sounds even more extreme, as if these whales are actually spooked. They get anxiety mm. when they, when they're confronted with this this noise. It's offensive. But can them, you imagine? And they, they shoot to the surface. They're so freaked quicker. out by it. Yeah, when yeah. you're diving, they should. It, it, when you're diving and you hear all sorts of noises, don't you? And yeah. you know, you can hear the boats, engines. Yeah. You can hear far off, maybe a dolphin or something. Mm. But especially when it's really nice and quiet, and you all of a sudden you hear an engine roar up or something, you get the dive boat move. Mm. So you can imagine it for a whale, because they don't know so. Now all mm. of a sudden that you know they're swimming along, and all of a sudden they hear that noise, they're yeah. going to get spooked, mm. aren't they? Mm. And they're going to go the opposite direction to try and get away from it. It's going to compete make them completely delirious I guess and, and really freak them out yeah. and they're incredibly and sensitive you know these creatures basically yeah. go on on these natural abilities to, to interact and communicate with each other underwater and all of a sudden you've got this massive warship kind of hoving into their environment because it could be all sorts of sonar couldn't it right? exactly yeah different frequencies and things I think this research is only kind of just sort of touched the surface of it really um, according to the research there are 121 mass strandings of beaked whales between 1960 and 2004 and it's reckoned that at least 40 of those incidents were linked closely with naval activities mm. yeah so are they an ad- endangered species do you think uh, i believe so yeah well, most whales are yeah, yeah. kind yeah. of on, the, on mean, the, the watch list aren't they yeah the, the, the place to go for that if you i think we may have spoken about this on a previous episode is the iucn mm. Website That's and they right, have yeah. the red list, yeah. Yeah. which is the International Union for Conservation and Nature, mm. and you can go there and you can go by species and and if you're curious as to those sort of aspects of uh, biological diversity, you can mm. then see exactly where each species stands. And, and most major organisations, when they're making decisions about the vulnerability of species, go and consult that. That's the kind of yeah. go-to resource for that kind of thing. Yeah. So yeah, if you're curious, you can go. There you go, Ian. There's there's a job so for you. you. Through now and the next step, you can go to. IUCN and look up beaked whales. Wow. Yeah. But it's, it's sad that, that, again, it's kind of a human interference mm-hmm. with animal behaviour. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's in a, in a negative way. There are, there are positive things we've done and we've spoken about them on in other news items where we've, we've spoken about how, on another episode, about how robots are helping us to bring coral back to certain regions. Yeah. We've spoken about how scientific discoveries and human interaction is helped us to find species we didn't know exist before. Yeah. So there's there's lots of positives that we do. It's a fine balance. This, this, isn't is, it? this is something else. This mm-hmm. is something where it's, it's not quite so, so rosy. It's a fine balance between how human Here we go. species... Brace yourself, Lou. Insightful <laughs> stuff coming up. Uh, live hand in hand <laughs> with animals, isn't it? Yeah. And we've got to try and do that without inflicting... Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. things onto animals. Yeah, stuff. it's definitely... This is, this is why it's important to have research why it's important to have data mm. available yeah. and why when we talk about resources like the IUCN they're vital for people making decisions at a high level with uh, conservation organizations and, and deciding on legislation mm. in, in different regions of the, of the world mm-hmm. yeah 
So there you go. That's my two penneth. Awesome. Any, anything else, else to add? Not on this particular one. No, we're all no. good. No. 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 All right. So we've actually got a, a good news uh, story. Hey. Yay! Angel sharks have been spotted off the Welsh coast yeah, in the I saw UK. That. Yeah. Brilliant news. Um, it's actually the the planet's or one of the planet's rarest shark species, and mm. um, they're on the the red list of threatened shark species. Yeah. Um, they've got an unusual flat appearance, wide pectoral fins, and big blotches on their bodies, which give them a similar... Yeah, they look weird, look the thing, way, don't they? Basically. Yeah. And, yeah, according to the BBC, the species only established a stronghold uh, in the Canary Islands. have been spotted off of... That's that's crazy. Wales, yeah. which is great, yeah. Yeah, I think and I think they're a really cool shark, actually. Mm. The, it's often like the, the big predatory ones that get a lot of press yeah but one of the first sharks i ever had an encounter with was an angel shark was it really? and i didn't even know it was an angel shark until it was almost nose to nose with me really um and i again i was in the canary islands i was mm-hmm. in grand canaria um with a f- friend of the podcast mr colin hill yeah. if you're out there listening colin <laughs> <laughs> dunk's having a little grimace <laughs> at the moment <laughs> but um i remember us we were we'd it was one of the f- first couple of dives. We'd gone out there for like a little diving jolly. We were going for a little dive and um, I saw what I thought was a, a ray in the sand because they, they are very flat, mm. very ray-like in their appearance. And as we got closer, maybe three, four metres away, it kind of flicked its tail, came up out of the sand. It came directly towards me and I thought, oh, that's a, I've not seen a ray like that before. And when it got really close, it, it just... Swam, I paused so yeah. I didn't want to interrupt it mm. and it just swam directly over the top of my head and as it went over wow. me and I saw saw the outline of it I realised what it was Yeah. Mm. and then I turned around and there was the, the local guide was called Jose as I remember and um, he gave me this, the shark sign and then I put <laughs> sort of two and two together and realised what it was Yeah. Wow. so I, I wasn't going looking for an angel shark in particular it just Very happened lucky. to be there yeah. Yeah. so in this country I wonder if they've now followed the warm currents up from the south I don't know. I don't know what the research is. With I don't think there's shark. been any particular um, definitive reason given. Uh, so a spokeswoman for the Zoological Society of London said that they think Wales is a really important area for the angel shark. And over the past few years, there's been a, a number of sightings from commercial fishers and recreational divers who yeah. have also seen angel sharks. So, yeah, there's no particular reason as given as to why they've been spotted off the coast yeah. of Wales. Yeah. but. It's, it's, good just, it's yeah. nice that it's nice they're out there. Yeah. Well, I've actually got two or three angel shark facts if you're interested, folks. Go for it, yeah. Me. All right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not literally. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so an average angel shark weighs about 77 pounds. So that's about 35 kilos, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. More or less. So they're quite a hefty yeah. beast. In the wild, angel sharks can live between 25 and 35 years. Okay. Which is. Quite pretty impressive. Pretty impressive yeah. lifespan. Yeah. Sometimes angel sharks are referred to as monkfish. Monkfish. And, <laughs> monkfish. And ironically, the sand devil. Ooh. Because they, they, they lurk in the sand, you know, as, as rays do. This is, my, as I said, yeah. my first experience, yeah. I, I mistook it for a ray for the mm-hmm. first few yeah. seconds of the encounter. And we've got also here, angel sharks tend to live in shallow, temperate waters, though some species like depths of up to 500 feet. So okay. what's that, about 150, 175 metres yeah. if, you're, if you're not in America. Yeah, yeah. so pretty deep. Yeah, so to see them in, in kind of recreational diving depths is, is, is not unusual because they do like to live in shallow temperate waters, but yeah. they, they do go a bit deeper as well. So there you go, that's, Quite a that's all I have. Spot them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's all my angel shark facts. I've got nothing more for you on that, I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good. Thanks for the input. Yeah. <laughs> Can we turn up? <laughs> Excellent. So is uh, is that the news? Indeed. That's the news over then. So given the time of year it is now when we're recording this, folks, a lot of you guys, girls out there, will be thinking about going diving again. We're now heading into springtime at the moment. We record this. We're now in February at the moment we're recording this. So if you're based in the UK or in Europe, then it won't be long. It's only going to be a few weeks before you start thinking about getting back out there yes. into the water. Now, your gear is going to have been sat around doing not a lot in your spare room, in your garage, in your attic, wherever you tend to keep in it. In the tub. In, in, sorry? In the tub. <laughs> Didn't you keep, keep yours in a tub? In a tub? Yeah. I thought you meant in well, your bath. In the bath, yeah. In a big tub. 
Oh, you mean well, Giggle the Bath? Box. Yeah. yeah. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. yeah. I thought you meant the bath. I thought you meant the bath. It's not a tub. It's a tub. Man alive. <laughs> <laughs> In Bungie, we call it a tub. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like the name of a movie. <laughs> yeah. In Bungie, we called it a tub. <laughs> This time he's back. <laughs> and he's angry. <laughs> okay, so um, you may be getting your gear out after it's been sat kind of dormant for a few months. And my, my view on, on this is that if your stuff's been lying around doing nothing, you need to check it. You need to get it serviced where appropriate if you're going to go diving in it. Just as you would if you had a car or a motorbike or something like this. And you would take your, say you had a motorbike that had been in the garage all winter... You want to check tyre pressures, you'd be checking oil levels, be making sure the brakes hadn't seized and were functioning as they should, all these kind of things. It's exactly the same in diving. With that in mind, we've got the charming debonair Here he friend is. of the podcast, Mr Duncan Baldwin. Woo! Uh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> the Earl of Horsford. <laughs> the Earl of Horsford is among us. <laughs> Together with the King of Bungie. Yes. Yeah, we're all landed gentry round here. Yeah. So, um, Dunk's with us because, well... You why can is explain, Dunk with us? Well, why, why is Dunk with us? Um, we, we found him because on the street. Because your, your first guest didn't come. Oh. Oh. Our second choice. He yeah, he's back up. He's a stunt double. Um, but Dunk, Dunk's with us because Dunk is a... You're a certified... Aqualung you're a certified many things, but yes, Apex yes. and Aqualung <laughs> service Aqualung technician. Apex technician, yeah. Yeah. So Dunk does a lot of the servicing. You service my regulators. Yep. A lot and of you're still here. Mine. I'm still here. Yep. Yep. Yours in, yeah. Yep. So I thought it might be really nice to have you in as someone who does pull regulators to bits and, and knows intimately how they function to ask you about the importance of servicing and any tips you have for regulators. So how long have you been servicing regulators, Duncan, and how many would you do on like a typical season? I've been servicing regs for, uh, since 2015. Yeah. And I do probably around about 100 sets a year. Yeah, so you've you cracked open a first stage or two in yep. your time. One or two, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Never have any spare parts once I've finished servicing, <laughs> which is always good. <laughs> it's always reassuring. It is. Yeah. Have, you, have you ever had a situation where you've put a reg back together and then there's been a spare O ring on the, on the side of the workshop? No. 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 That's nice. I, I say that because you've got mine to service at the moment. I have, they're in the back of my car. <laughs> well, um, hopefully, they're in the back of the car. They were when I left it. <laughs> I hope so too. Um, so, with your experience and, and uh, exposure to regulators have you got any tips for people who are perhaps getting their regulators out after a winter when they've been sat around doing nothing well ideally um, you want to have a look at the mouthpiece. piece yeah have a look at the hoses you know have they cracked over the winter yeah um, these are only cuts and nicks in the hoses themselves yeah um, another thing you can do is when you do look at the hoses pull the hose protector back Right. Because you'll be surprised at how many people's regs come in. Yeah, you'll pull the hose protector back, and obviously because it's protected from the sun, you'll see what the original colour was, mm. and then you can compare it to obviously what's been caught um, by the UV, mm-hmm. yeah. and see actually how old some of these hoses are. Yeah, yeah, in sort of shabby condition, mm. yeah. certain bits and pieces are in. Yeah. But so how long does a hose generally last for? Would you say, time wise? Uh, that's a tricky one. I guess it's like a set of tyres on a car. It depends what sort of life they have. Yeah. What, well, time-wise? Um, Aqualung says about five to eight years. Okay. Um, I have seen hoses come in to the dive shop 15, 20 years old. Really? And in all fairness, they do look okay. But it's like anything. A hose is £40. Pounds. If yeah. you think 10, 10 pence a day yeah. for a hose who, yeah. throughout the course of the year. Mm. Yeah. If you've got five hoses on your set of regs... Yeah, ten pence. If you replace one hose every year, so on a five-year cycle. Yeah. Yeah, ten pence a day is nothing. That's right. I wouldn't even yeah. buy a cheap sweet in the uh, corner shop. Mm. No, well, I might have done back in my day. You know, <laughs> a quarter of you know cool cubes and you know some pineapple sweets. Yeah. <laughs> but these days, I'm afraid it doesn't give you a lot. That's a good way of putting it, actually. Yeah. 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 yeah ten yeah. pence is all it is a day. Yeah. 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 I think this. I think it's true. And. We're always harping on about it when we, we talk about these things, but regs are your lifeline. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah, I wouldn't want to be at 30, 40 metres, 100 foot or whatever beneath the surface no. with unserviced, poorly maintained regulators any more mm. than I'd want to be doing laps of Brands Hatch in a car where the tyres are, are old and perished. Well, your life yeah. depends on them, doesn't it? Yeah. You, know, yeah. you, you, need to, mm. you need to have that confidence in your... Yeah. 
Red. Like you were saying with the hoses, they might look fine on the inside, but you don't know what the inside no. might be. No, it's difficult to see. Mm. Yeah. I mean, for people at home, I guess, checking hoses, it's really a case of just very closely looking at them for frays. In the old school hoses, sometimes I can remember seeing them when they start to let go, you see kind of little bubbles. Yeah. Yeah, appear bubbles, yeah. And kind of ruptures, a bit like a, an old tyre, where kind of mm. like a blister. Yeah, blistering, yeah. Blistering down the side of the hose, um, which meant that, you know, Within there, they were, the gas was escaping and building up in yeah. certain places, mm. and that was always a it's a newer sign. kind of carbon fibre design, like the woven effect yeah. ones. But the it's essentially, ones, yeah. it's the same concept, though, isn't it? It's still yeah. a hose; it's still yeah. going to have the same amount of pressure mm. surging through yeah. it. And, yeah. but and if right. you bend it, I mean, if you don't have a braided hose, yeah, because um, obviously they are probably stronger. Yeah, but if you get a um, normal hose and you just bend it, I'm not yeah. saying you got to tie into a, you know. Uh, a sheep shank not or some, <laughs> something in particular um, if you just bend it you can physically notice the cracking yeah repairing yeah, yeah. Um, get it replaced yeah you know, 10 pence a day that's the way I look at it yeah yeah. it's peanuts that makes sense to me I mean I, with my car I, I put away a little bit each month towards servicing and MOTs for it and that kind of thing so to do the same with your regulators and know that you, you're going to be safe on the end of them makes sense to me yeah yeah and I always think if there's any doubt just send them in for a service. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I think one of one of the, and we've spoken about this before. I think where some people, and I, put, from a personal point of view, and this is just my opinion, I wouldn't recommend it. But some people will buy, say, a second-hand set of regs off eBay or an auction site somewhere. Oh, don't get me started on that one. Um, <laughs> don't get me. Because <laughs> I think that the danger is there. It's a bit like just buying a second-hand car from somewhere. You you never quite know it's been treated. You know, you never know what's yeah. going on under the bonnet you? you're buying blind yeah. a little bit i'm just interested and this isn't me dismissing every single set of regs you might find second hand on the web no, somewhere so but put yours up for sale <laughs> <laughs> thanks very much Doug. <laughs> let me know if you make a profit <laughs> one careful owner <laughs> so i'm a bit at a pound <laughs> you can contact dunk you you'll be, we'll be putting your email address on at the end of the podcast yeah. for bits. <laughs> <laughs> but no, um, getting Excuse back to what me. you've just said, Marcus, um, I had a set come in, I think it was last year, lady bought them off the internet, great, lovely, got a cheap set of regs here, took them apart, needed five hoses, 40, 35, 40 quid a set of hose, so it's £200 for a start, yeah. on top of what she'd paid for them, I'm not sure what she paid for them. When I go to proceed to pull them apart, they'd seized up, mm. they'd actually... While I was trying to undo the first stage, which was connected to the tank, yeah. I actually managed to undo the valve in the tank, because yeah. that seized up. When I eventually did get the second stage apart, the O-ring weren't the right size. Oh, really? Yeah, there's a little pin that holds the spindle in. That had been mastic in, oh, no and that was just seized solid. In fact, the, the local dive shop, the owner of it, um, said he'd quite prepared to obviously do a letter, um, so she could go back to the seller on eBay yeah. to say, look, you know, you've sold me these as yeah. work and regulate uh, yeah. set of regs. Yeah. And to be honest, that's, that's potentially dangerous. That's, yeah, yeah, it's almost a death sentence. It's, yeah. I view that as like you, when you hear these horror stories about people buying a car and then finding out it's a cut and chuck and there's yeah. two cars yeah. being yeah. welded yeah. together. Yeah. It's that sort of danger element where yeah. if, if it goes wrong and you have an accident in that car, then you're in big trouble. And same yeah. with these regs. You imagine being them suddenly 20 stopping meters down or something. working completely. I mean, most regulators of these have these downstream valves, and if they, they let yeah. go, they free flow, and you know yeah. you go through the procedures you're trained with. Yeah. If they just stop delivering gas, or I don't know, it's a whole different kettle of fish, yeah. isn't it? Shocking, know? isn't it? It is because you know even if you paid a hundred pound for, yeah. you know, um, two hundred pound for the five new hoses, yeah, plus on top a normal service about a hundred pounds, yeah, that's four hundred pounds mm-hmm. she's yeah. spent already, mm-hmm. and potentially there's still an old set of regulators. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Whereas you know for another. Hundred pound, hundred and fifty pounds. She can have a brand new set, yeah, with some sort of guarantee and come back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the local, the local and, dive shop. And you know they're tip top. They're brand new. Yeah. They're box fresh. So yeah, From you're a, good. A reputable retailer and a, yeah. yeah, yeah. Because that's before you know. Have you got a part? Yeah. How many internal parts does it need? Yeah. If it needs a new spindle, thirty pounds. Yeah. Yeah. All these bits are going to add up. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. I mean, I can remember. I'm going to tell a little story here but I can remember I used to going to take long <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, <can> make... <laughs> I can cut a short story long <laughs> no, I, I remember um, managing a centre elsewhere in the UK years ago and used to get regularly people come in with sets of older regulators 
I said, oh, brilliant, you bring them in for service. No, there's just a little bit of a hissing coming from this particular aspect of it. When were they last served? Oh, they haven't been serviced, but can you just fix the hissing sound? And for me, it's, that's, bit, that's kind of just that's putting a, a Band-Aid on something that needs further attention. Yeah. Um, so I've never quite understood that mentality. And the reason for it is I, I know from the times I've worked in different places, the kind of pounding and, and, and hard work that regs go through and also what they're exposed to, particularly sometimes in tough environments that we have in the UK, when you're in and out of somewhere like the North Sea and cold water environment, salt water, and also in tropical environments. I can remember stripping down, and, and you'll find in a lot of tropical places they use kind of cheap piston regs. I say cheap, they're still perfectly good if anyone out there is a manufacturer, <laughs> but things like a Scuba Pro Mark II or an Intro Mares Rover or something like this, um, which are kind of an entry level rig. We used to, in a particular dive centre I worked for in the tropics, used to have Scuba Pro Mark IIs, which were a simple piston rig. They're not cold water rated. I can remember at the beginning of the season, together with a colleague of mine, stripping them down, and they'd only been sat around for a few, you know, a few weeks in the off season, just to to begin to service mm-hmm. them. And inside one first stage, opened up, and there's like a little nest of spiders inside. And I thought, someone somewhere, if they they're not taking the trouble to service their regs, just something as innocent as that. It's not like there's a mechanical fault, but would you want to breathe through a kind of a, a bunch not of baby part, spiders? Yeah. Yeah. And your life is <laughs> dependent yeah. on them, isn't it? So yeah. this is just one of those, those little things. But yeah. getting back to what you are saying, when you're in the tropics and places like that, don't forget, obviously, being an instructor like yourself, Marcus, when you're in the swimming pool, you've got all chemicals in the swimming pool. Yeah. Yeah. So although that looks lovely and shiny, yeah. because it's not been subject to salt, it has been subject to chemicals. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Not obviously has an adverse effect on your hoses and bits and pieces. That's right. I think Lou had a question about about um, kind of post dive equipment care and that kind of thing as well. But what do you? Um, so when you finish your diving, do you? Right, uh, Lou. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, my voice. <laughs> sorry. I was thinking, you know, after you di- after you've been for a dive, do you um, clean the rigs out with um, de- uh, Dettol? D- Dettol? <laughs> No, no. I mean, just basically all you need to do is just hose them down. Ideally, if you can take them home and put them in the sink, great. But one thing you need to be aware of is if you're putting them in the sink, don't push the purge button in. Because mm. then you've got the potential of obviously water going into the hose, potentially getting, getting into the first stage. But just hose it down. Um, also, if your rig's got an adjustment, run the tap, run under the tap, your second stage, and move the actual adjustment on your second stage. Yeah. Yeah, and then just let it soak for maybe 15, 20 minutes. I didn't know whether there's some kind of act- antibacterial agent you could put to the, into the water to wash it through with the regs. Kind of stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying oh, to think of another you've word. Got some dodgy ill scene. No, um, <laughs> I mean you may want to use. Well, in the because in the UK you got you know some of the water is quite murky and you know you've got all sorts sediment of sediment, sediment stuff, builds yeah. up and stuff. So I thought maybe some kind of uh, anti bacterial sexy, yeah. yeah type agent would would help clean that and rinse we it all through well the, yeah the, 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 the local dive center obviously yeah. do when they come back on the weekend but yeah. obviously they regulate what students are used to obviously before they obviously get used by another student then mm. yes i think they go into a, a big tub yeah with, um, it's more of a hygiene thing. yeah it's a hygiene it's like thing as opposed to stuff, yeah. yeah but your yeah. own personal set of regs i just no. rinse them yeah you rinse through do you get a whiff yeah. of garlic with yours <laughs> Here we go. Mm. Hang on. No, sometimes well, well, I've noticed. Brace that yourself, in, Dunk. Well, welcome to the podcast. I've noticed. <laughs> I sometimes get a whiff of garlic. It's like when you first like. Because uh, it depends what you've eaten, doesn't it? No, yeah, but when you um, with your well, belching into your egg. <laughs> so first dive before I even jumped in the water, you know, you, you t- you're doing your buddy check. And yeah. That, yeah. And it's like, whoa. Oh, so you surface <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you sometimes get like a, a whiff of garlic. No. 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 Okay. You shouldn't really. That's all part of the buddy check, isn't it? So when you... Yeah, you, your buddy's in the That's what I mean. Taste like, and smell yeah. okay. Yeah, like, yeah. Mm, Okay. Oh. Maybe it's garlic. <laughs> Never had that in. No. No. Okay. I think that can go in the, in the bag with, with the magpies. <laughs> <laughs> And Bob Carroll, geez, we'll put it. In, we'll put it in and that little. We'll put it in that drawer over there, shall we? Okay. <laughs> we're just gonna leave that. <laughs> yeah, we're just gonna leave that. Perhaps we'll come back to that at a later date. <laughs> Ian and his garlic flavoured rigs. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I mean, winding up a little bit on 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 rigs, I think 
for me, regular servicing is essential. Mm -hmm. I always yeah. follow manufacturer guidelines with that. Um, they mind going once a year, which is what Apex recommend for my particular yeah. regs, or a certain amount of dives spill having your yeah. car service. Yeah, I mean, obviously, if you're doing a lot of dives, yeah, then it, it more, get them in more frequently, yeah. Yeah. Um, so what we're saying, sort of like 25, 50, 50 dives? Well, or it something? depends on the manufacturer. So I'm not going to go into every individual manufacturer, but there are some manufacturers, for example, like, say, Atomic, who are well known for having longer service intervals on their regulators. Yeah. Um, whether that's a good or a bad thing, I don't know. It's like some cars, they recommend you don't have to have a major service for you know, 30,000 miles or 40,000 yeah. miles. So it depends on what the manufacturer guidelines are. Yeah. But what I would say is if you if you when you buy regs, if you're buying them new, which is obviously the ideal, mm -hmm. to get some up-to-date regs because technology moves on just like it does with cars and motorbikes. So yeah. the, the newer, the, the better ones you can have, the, the nicer experience you're going to have in the water. But if you're not, if you're buying second-hand and they're not coming with an instruction manual, I would always recommend going to the manufacturer's site or certainly doing some research at a reliable source and finding out when the service intervals are on them. And if you're not sure, if you bought them and you've just bought them on spec online somewhere, take them in, get them serviced. Yeah, straight away. It's a typical service cost in the UK. I don't know, depends on the model. Yeah. yeah. So around, if you said yeah. around £100 mark, $120, about €100, Euros, isn't it? It's about the same. Yeah. Um, then. For peace of mind. Two peace of mind. mind. Two pound a week. Yeah. 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 That wouldn't even get you a, a coffee from one of these high street stores. No. Yeah, exactly right. Chains, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. If in doubt, check it out. Yeah. I like that. Oh, that's it's true. Good. If in doubt, check it out. Maybe you should do that with yours, Ian. You know, <laughs> maybe when you take yours into the dive shop, say, you know, they've got a taste a of garlic. A whiff of garlic. Yeah. 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 Maybe it's one of your children and put something in there for you. <laughs> and, uh, surprise. A yeah. snack for later. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. But if they're not looked after or something goes wrong, then can be. Fine. Um, can yeah. be disastrous. Yeah. I've, I've had a problem. It's the only time I've ever had an equipment failure. I hope that wasn't when I serviced them. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Duncan, no, it wasn't. But the only time I've had an equipment failure with scuba was to do with the regs. I had a hose let go onto about 28 metres and the, the hose, the high-pressure hose for the for the gauge let go. Um, and I was just in my own little jacuzzi and I could see the... The needle going down, and I probably had about thirty seconds before I was down to nothing, oh. um, which at that depth wasn't good. No. No. Um, and uh, I'd, I was I was leading four people. I was at a, I was at a dive site called Richelieu Rock, oh, yeah. um, which you've been to with me, Lovely Louise, place. haven't you? Yeah. Um, it's a really nice dive mm. site, and so I turned around and got the attention because I I was on a single tank, you know, a single aluminium tank, because I was diving in the tropics. It wasn't like I was in scapa with a twin set on my back to bail mm. out from one to the other or something like this um, and so I turned around I identified the person who I knew was <laughs> of the four people I was guiding who I knew had the most air left because of course you're checking their air anyway because you're yeah. guiding them around you're asking them from time to time and I went directly to that person who happened to be this girl I can't remember her name now because it was about oh, five oh I'm sure you can Marcus <laughs> <laughs> how very <laughs> dare you <laughs> what are you saying <laughs> um and I gave her, the, I just went, we did what you do in training. And I gave her the signal to, to share air and I went to her alternate. And the, the biggest challenge was that I think in those situations, there will be people who were paying attention during their training yeah. and who recognise what, what's going on. Yeah. They know it's not a drill mm. if the instructor's turning around and is sharing air on a guided dive at 28 mm. metres. Mm. You can see all the bubbles. And, and see in a jacuzzi around. Yeah. Right? Mm. And I'm, I'm gathering up the group. The problem was these guys, because it was such a beautiful dive site and there's so much going on, <coughs> they kind of, not forgot, but in the time it took us to do a safe ascent from that depth, they almost forgot the situation we were in. Yeah. Um, so I signaled to the guys that we needed to come up. I brought them. I worked out which way the current was, was running. So which way to leave Richley Rock? Because just a, it's a big pinnacle, like a horseshoe shape, mm -hmm. in the middle of nowhere, really. Mm -hmm. um, because what I didn't want to do was surface and then have us blown onto the rocks. I needed to surface at the side of it where we would be blown away from the rocks, so the boat could pick us up when we surfaced. I was working this out while breathing from the alternate, trying to get the guys to come up with the same level mm -hmm. as us. And as we came up, I then had to let go of the contact I had with this diver because I needed to launch an SMB because. 
and no disrespect to holiday divers, but being typical holiday divers, none of them had an SMB in real with them, yeah. apart from me. Yeah. So I then need to make a signal because there's lots of boat traffic in that yeah. area. Yeah. I then signal that I'm going to launch an SMB. For those of you who, can't, who obviously can't see me, I'm doing the <laughs> SMB signal now. <laughs> okay. I let go of this girl, unclip my SMB, and as I go to launch it, she then is distracted and sees a school of barracuda going past and swims off and leaves me with nothing. Just literally, <laughs> the rake is pulled from my mouth and I have to quickly oh, no. swim back after her oh, and put no. it back in again. Oh. It's like she's, she's she, at this point, she's almost forgotten that I'm you know, we're, we're, we're sharing air here. Yeah. Yeah. This, is, this isn't, you know, important, yeah. we're not doing a drill, I'm just going to go, okay, that was a nice test. Yeah. I'll swap back to my primary now and carry on about my day. Um, and that, and yeah, when we got, uh, the, the strangest thing was we then got to the surface and of course, I'm then in a position where I have no gas to inflate my jacket. Yeah. It's very much what you tell students in training. Uh -huh. So I'm kicking and already inflating. As soon as we hit the surface, she just swims away from me. There's no sort of support. In <laughs> and they go, well, so why have we come up? <laughs> did, you not, did you not notice the jacuzzi around me? And uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, but I know that's why I went off. Stuff, just right? shows it happens. Yeah. It? Yeah. 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 Sure. I know I went off a little bit of a tangent there, but that's just to kind of tell us, hopefully, a story that explains why regular checks of your hoses, regular checks of your regs yeah. are necessary. Mine had been serviced. It just happened that... Not by me. Not, not, <laughs> not by Duncan. But it's just one of those things where... It's like having a puncture in your car. You, these things can happen randomly, yeah. Yeah. but if you take good care of them... It's less like prevention is better than cure. Exactly yeah, right. It reduces yeah. risk, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. just going back on to what you just said. I mean, the amount of people you bring their eggs in, you put them all back together. You then put them in the pool to yeah. make sure there's no air leaks. But then suddenly you look at the gauge, and it's got a leak from the SPG. Mm. Yeah. Well, if that person had come in, what well, you know, is they, they the equipment is service obviously ones that come in. But if they were to just turn around, oh by the way, I actually have a leak on the SPG. But these people, what are, are they oblivious to it when they're diving? Do they never look at their gauge? Do they not notice the jacuzzi beside them? Do they think it's a thermal spring? <laughs> yeah. For our non-divers, what's the SPG? For our non-divers, pressure gauge. Okay. It's it's a thing that tells head. you how much air you got, but like your fuel gauge in your car. Yeah. Cool. Yep. There you go. So that's that's sort of regs really. Um, look after them, service them, and they look after you. That's the mm -hmm. deal. Um, we were going to go through every single bit of equipment as pre-season prep, but we have waffled on a wee bit, so I thought... We don't do that, do we? I know. Oh, we go off a little tangent. That's part of our charm here. <laughs> it's usually a nautical nightmare, yeah. you know, with a shilly rock. <laughs> yeah. Do we not During get a tea break in there, then? <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's an interval on ice cream in a minute, don't you? Just be like at the cinema. Yeah, if you, if you hang around, <coughs> there's a girl going to come through with a tray with a cornetto for you. Wow. I prefer a Western hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> Innuendo alarm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Steady. Baron of Bungie is getting excited. I know. Or the King of Bungie. So rather than go through everything, because I think we're going to run out of time, and I'm, I'm, I'm really conscious of, of keeping these at reasonable length these days, but I know Louise is, is really itching to talk about cylinders and cylinder care, because that's, again, one of those ones that people kind of forget about, mm. and... and particularly because a lot of people just rent cylinders when they go on holiday, but people who own them come into the dive centre, wherever you happen to be for a fill, and there is the certain things that are sort of red flags for you, aren't they? So mm, yeah, what, what are your thoughts, Lou? Well, not everyone owns their own cylinder. No, you know, true. Out of all the items of dive gear, cylinders are probably sort of lower down on you know, the items that people possess, but some people do choose to have their own tank for whatever reason. And like you're saying, at the dive centre we have people come in on a regular basis, on a daily basis, to, to have tanks filled. And it's it's interesting seeing people's approaches to, in, like you were saying, Duncan, with regard to the regulators, some people's attitudes towards their tanks can be equally as... Yeah. ...sounding brutal, but ignorant, really. Yeah. And it's it's really difficult to try and, you know, explain to people the, the potential, you know, implications of them not looking after their tanks so for example you know you should never drain your tank so if you have your own scuba cylinder or if you're using it to um, charge an air gun like we have some customers come into the shop with um, you never drain the tank as soon as you drain the cylinder of all its air it creates moisture which creates condensation in turn potentially creating rust yeah. 
Um, and as soon as you've got rust inside a tank, it's never a good, you know, never a good ending. Um, so never fully drain your tank. Obviously, you know, you want to leave a bit in there, maybe sort of 20 bar. And um, it's difficult for people who might be travelling with their cylinders. So we had a chap in the other day. Um, actually, it was Craig, so one of our... Um, Patreons, Ray, Craig Morris, Ray, hi Craig, Craig. you listening? Top man. Um, so yeah, he came in with a three litre pony bottle and Craig goes over to Fort Lauderdale in Florida quite frequently. Nice. Indeed. And um, he will. takes the um, the pony bottle with him and he's explaining that he, he drains the, the bottle for obviously yeah, aviation sort of safety reasons. Um, so that's a difficult one. So where you've, you've got to, to drain it, but... If you have got to drain it, that window of leaving it empty, try and minimise it as soon as possible. So literally, it's the last thing you do before you leave the house to go to yeah. the airport. As soon as you get there, go to the dive centre, get them to put some gas in it. Um, it minimises that risk of that condensation collecting, essentially. How are 3D the ponies not available then in Fort, Laura, Fort Lauderdale then? Well, sure. I don't know. I maybe. think he just prefers to take his dog Yeah, mine, that's fine. Right. I, I think it, I'm just curious yeah. why he... Some Takes people some people do take these kind of things just mm. sort of as a side as a little aside to that. Um, there are some people who really like these. Um, you've seen SMBs with these tiny little crack bottles, yeah. that kind yeah. of little, little mini yeah. cylinders yeah. that they use to fill their SMBs, SMBs to launch them to the surface. I've always gone for over inflation or use my alternate or my bubbles or whatever. But some people do like them. And that's fine. Mm. Um, all I'd say about that is you're in the same situation and it's still a pressurized little cylinder. And once yeah. you've launched it, it's there empty. Yeah. And it's surrounded by water, it's submerged in water, right the way till you get back on the boat again. Mm. And until it's filled again, then you're in that same situation that you've just described, Lou. You're exposed and to that risk. I have heard stories of, of some boat skippers refusing to let people on particular boats for that reason, where if someone turns up with one of those and they don't know the history of it or whatever, because that's just as much of an explosion risk. Okay, it's yeah. a smaller cylinder, but it can still have exactly the same problems. So I've never seen it happen, um, but I know that there are, there's a school of thought out there that that, yeah. that, that they are potential risk. Yeah. You know. What's your thoughts on storage of tanks when they're not in use, outside or inside? Inside. Yeah. So always store them in a, a cool, dry place. Um, you know, especially if it's somewhere where there's, there's a cool climate. So you know, it's very cold in the UK at the moment. Yeah. And you have people that just leave them in the boot of the cars, and they'll come in for a fill, and it's it's ice cold. And when we fill a tank, you you imagine you've suddenly got all this pressure going through to this tank, and then That's they charge enough. very quickly, yeah. and it gets red hot, and it can go from. Yeah, it was minus five the other day, I think, overnight, wasn't it? And you've got this tank that's been left in the boot of the car, or the trunk, for our US listeners, and um, it's been sat there, ice cold, and all of a sudden it's heating up. And that alone can... Because there must be a lot of people store know, their tank tanks damage. in the garage. Yeah, garages. Rather than indoors at the, end of the day, if, it, if it's somewhere safe, you know, never leave your bottles stood up, always lay them down because you don't want it falling on your foot or the cat or whatever. Um, but you want to store it somewhere that's safe and, yeah, yeah. where it's not going to be exposed to any kind of, um, yeah, conditions that could affect not just the inside of the tank but the outside of the tank as well. Yeah. Some people buy the, the little valve protectors, so it's like a little hood that sits over the first okay. stage. Um, some people prefer to stick one of those on and just protect it, so... Um, um, and so you can get the little screwy, screw in things, can't you? Hang on, yeah, so innuendo you alert again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you get the little insert so you can just screw yeah, in. Yeah, you do. I've, yeah. I've not been a big fan yeah. of them myself, but um. you, you still got a. They're still, it's still part of it exposed, isn't it? Yeah. So even though it's not, you know, if you got didn't. I think they're more to keep dust out, really, aren't they? Yeah, always leave it somewhere that's not going to be interfered with. It's not going to be you know, susceptible to any kind of moisture or mm. anything like that yeah, really. yeah. Um, and with, with regard to testing tanks so for scuba cylinders so if you're going to breathe compressed air off the tank in the UK certainly it's every 30 months that you need to have it tested yeah. um, and for standard tank service you're looking at I think it's like 45 and that would be three for the 30 months and often the people who test it for you they'll give you a, a charge out of that as well so yeah. it'll come back filled up um, and then it's basically stamped on the neck of the bottle and it will notify you of when the next 
Yeah, because it says key. on the stamp. Yeah, and whether yeah, it's a yeah. hydrostatic or a visual test that's required next. Yeah. Um, and obviously, if anything else you need doing, if it needs a new valve kit, if it needs shot blast and anything like that, then, yeah, that's additional on top of that. Yeah. But getting back to being like Meg's, really, it's better safe than sorry. Yeah. You know, some people come in with a tank and expecting it to be filled, it's out of test, or, you know, as, as a filler... It might be in test, but it might look a right pig's ear on the outside. It might have been mistreated. Once you get chatting to people, it's interesting, you know, <laughs> to it learn how it's been treated. Yeah. Um, and it's at our discretion as a filler to to say, actually, no, I'm not comfortable with, you know, exposing myself to that risk. Yeah. yeah. Um, because the consequences can be catastrophic. And, yeah, um, yeah if a tank blows, there's no warning. No. It's mm. like a... Yeah, well, it's like yeah. an explosion. I, I, I heard one go let go once. Um, I was at an inland site, and it was like someone had fired a shotgun. <laughs> it was really... Was that the one at Stony Cove? Yeah. Mm. You might have been there with me, Lou. No. I can't remember. We're, we're going... We're talking about maybe 10 years ago now, at right. least. But I remember hearing it go off and thinking someone had fired a gun. It was it was that sort of intensity of, of noise. Right. And if um, you're in the crossfire, there's, it's not going to be pretty. No. Yeah. No, I, I think on that particular one. occasion... After the event, I'd gone up a little bit later and, and chatted to the guys at the fill station. You know, is everyone okay? What mm. happened? Blah, blah, blah. And apparently the valve shot off the, the top of the cylinder and went through the wall. It was really? Kind of, yeah, came out like a bullet. And uh, so th- these things can happen, you know. Mm. Um, and, and I agree with you about, about tank filling. There's always a risk to it. Yeah. And even after all these years, and I don't know how many hundreds of tanks I've filled over the mm. years, but... There's always that element of checking it, double checking it. If I hear anything hissing, it just puts me on edge. Yeah, yeah. you know what I mean. You leave it for someone else. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, when that lovely lady Lou comes into the dog, <laughs> yeah. yeah. she can do those. Yeah. Because yeah. um, they can go wrong. I mean, there, there was um, there was a quite a horrible story recently in the press. I think it was about a year ago. And strangely, aluminium tanks are more susceptible to letting go yeah. than steel tanks. But there was a there's chap in Australia working in a dive centre. He lost his leg. He lost his leg when a tank let go that, that perhaps the cylinder hadn't hadn't been cared for, mm. and there's no there's no warning there's no kind of like mm. on countdown it just goes yeah. and then and then that's it. So cylinder care is is really important. Mm. The only other thing I was going to say we, we talked about we talked about temperature for cylinder care, um, but I'm not sure did we talk about temperature of cylinder filling and, and giving them ample time to. To, for tank to fills, fill, yeah. yeah, for tank fills. So they, you know, it's it's always good to do tank filling slowly. Yeah. So you want to, and um, you shouldn't be filling tanks unless you've been trained um, specifically how to do it. So you know, compressors and banks and filling stations are quite complex zones, and yeah, like you say, they can get very hot very quickly. They yeah. can, you know, there's a lot going on. Yeah. When you fill in a tank, yeah. I mean, one one thing I always say to people when they're, they're having their tanks filled, um, and this applies whether you're in a holiday environment or just in a in a dive centre somewhere, is obviously when they're, they're 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 pumped with gas and they heat up. For every degree Celsius, you then lose as the tank cools down. You mm. lose pressure of zero point six bar. Mm-hmm. So if you can leave that tank with the dive centre. And say come back the next day, rather than come in and go want to expect to fill in the next ten minutes. Mm. You're always going to be better off because that tank can then be topped up, and you're going to get that genuine 220, 230 bar, yeah. or the equivalent in psi. Whereas if not, you you'll get your 230. Read 230. It's a genuine 230 at that moment, but by the time it's cooled down in the boot of your car, mm-hmm. you may be left with 180 yeah. or something yeah. like this. Yeah, and or then you, you go away, curse and the dive yeah, and you uh, yeah. and and then you. you they gave me they short filled me that particular <laughs> and that's not the case at all it's not it's the physics. case at all. it's just the way it works yeah this is why if you're ever on a liverboard boat they'll they say 200 bar is a full tank mm-hmm. because when everyone gets out of the water my job when i was working as a trip leader was get everyone off the dive deck as soon as possible so you can get the whips out and start yeah. filling the tanks because mm-hmm. you want a maximum amount of time to trickle the air into the tanks, yeah. so there's a chance to cool down and be sure that everyone gets a minimum of 200 bar. Mm. Yeah. If it's a, if there's a rush because someone's stayed too long in the water, or whatever the, the consequences are, and there's less than 200 bar, then you've then, then got to postpone the dive and then retop up their tank and this kind of stuff. Yeah. And it's just a, it's just a pain mm. yeah. to do that. Um, but there you go. I've got nothing more to say on cylinders and tanks at the moment. 
don't know about anyone else. Not from the no. 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 After a fill, it's always nice to put your hands on the top. They work warm, warm your hands. And you <laughs> to do that. Like a little rainbow. Oh, yeah. Put your hands on the top. That would just warm your hands. He cooks an egg and bacon mate. on it. <laughs> Goodbye. That <laughs> yeah, was good. Um, I think we'll wrap it up now. I think we're done. With I was going to do some other bits, but I can think... I come back next week? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe you have to bring us cakes. Come yeah, back. Yeah, it's a deal. Interestingly, oh. just while while we've got you here and it's on air, we've had as we've been recording this, we've had a little bit of live interaction from some of our listeners on the Facebook page because we we did put up, as we were recording this as a bank episode, Lou put up a, a picture of us. And we've had one from Stephen Stephen Baxter. He's one. He's just said, looking forward to it, guys. That was really nice. And then we've had three people who clearly know you, Duncan, who've who've posted on. Is that you, Marcus, you, Ian, and you, Lou? <laughs> no, 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 no. We've had uh, Chris Burrell, who's who's posted and said, "Hope the bleep machine is working." Yeah. <laughs> bleep, 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 bleep. There you Paul, go, crispy. Paul Fisher, who said, "You're taking a bit of a risk there. Plenty of editing on this one." Yeah. Yeah. And Mel Chilvers. Who I'd like to as well. Lou, Lou and I were going to just thank for that news item earlier. Yes. She she flagged up yeah. to us. Yeah. Um, who said the snacks aren't going to last long? Oh, <laughs> love you too, Scuba Mum. Got you all wrong, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, I tell you. <laughs> that you reputation go. I have. Yeah, it's not deserved. No. He's a nice guy, really. Honestly, listeners. <laughs> so on that, well, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up. And thanks for listening to us. Yeah. Um, we'll be back again. We're not sure when this one's going to go out, but we hope you enjoyed our little chat about regulators and tanks which are two essential bits of kind of scuba gear and we'll yeah. see you next time yeah. bye bye au revoir see ya. that's French okay thanks for listening this is just an independent podcast and we don't represent Paddy, SSI, BZAC or any other training agencies. Uh, we are just three friends sitting around talking about diving and other diving related issues. Just our opinions, that's it. Uh, you can contact us on the usual social media sites. Instagram, Scuba Confidential. Facebook at Scuba Confidential. Twitter at Scuba Confident one email at scuba confidential at gmail.com and you can support us also on a site called patreon at patreon.com backslash scuba confidential and lastly just want to say thank you to Plunkett for the excellent music over and out peace and love